Benefits of Suffering, still in the book of Job. In the last remaining chapters, I think there's a few left. Before we get started, uh, our normal routine is that we uh, prefer to get in the right place in our relationship with God the Father, and that means simply that we can uh, confess our sin, or a better way to say it might be to acknowledge them. Uh, once we acknowledge them, He forgives them and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and we are able to uh, grow, learn the Word of God, and also glorify Him in, in His righteousness and not our own. So let's go ahead and pray now. <clears throat> Dear Father, we thank you for the amazing day. We know that you're in control of everything that we see, and we just praise you for that. We know you're worthy of all the praise, and we just ask today that we can focus, concentrate, and uh, learn the word. We know you have something in store for every one of us. You have a plan, and you have a very detailed plan that you want us to follow, and we just pray that we can be on board fully as much as possible in body, mind, and soul. We thank you for all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, the benefits of suffering. Suffering. Um, number 11. I didn't know exactly how far this was going to go, but we're on number 11. And I think this might be the last three of these. I'm not sure. But it seems like we're at the end of Job anyway. So, I know there are other books that mention a lot of suffering, and one of those is uh, First and Second Peter, is a book of suffering. So I haven't decided if we're going to keep going with this or uh, completely switch to something else. We'll see. Uh, if you remember last time we left off with Elihu uh, talking to Job about kind of getting some sense into him about who God is. Um, because remember he was listening and he didn't agree with anyone so he finally got to speak and he's basically presenting God's case to Job you know kind of just explaining to him about um, wisdom telling him uh, God's character and you know kind of what were you thinking Job type of deal and uh, and let me just start off with reading a little bit of this we're down to verse or chapter 37 this is this is still the same Elihu speaking to Job. At verse 23, it says, The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is exalted in power, and he will not do violence to justice and abundant righteousness. Therefore, men fear him. So, uh, the word to do violence here means that God will not discipline or make one humble where there is justice and an abundance of righteousness. That's what this verse is telling us. He will not do violence or discipline uh, justice and abundant righteousness. And so that tells us if we don't want discipline, well, here's the formula. Righteousness and justice. And that's in our lives. So I think this is one, kind of one of the main focuses of the book of Job is God's righteousness and justice. Think about it. Uh, you know, we started off with Job being upright, a very righteous person, uh, not self-righteous, but righteous. He kind of turned the corner on that later. But, and then you have God's dealings with Job in that state that he was in at the beginning of the book. Well, Job kind of turned the table, not really. He tried to uh, portray turning the table on God by his uh, testimony. You know, he wanted his, his shot and he wanted to present his case to God that God was wrong and he was supposed to vindicate him. He had done nothing wrong. And so these things are kind of coming together at the end of the book and we can see that now that Elihu's trying to snap some sense into him. And so... Um, but we do know that God is perfect righteousness as well. So, and remember Job 1.1, there was a man in the land of 
us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. That's how we started. You're like, okay, this is going to be a good, great Christian story, and he's going to pass this test with flying colors. That's what it sounds like. Um, but we know that we're human. And, uh, but keep in mind that Job is righteous and holy and upright because of who God is. That's why this has started that way, because Job was in tune with the spiritual life, in tune with that relationship. And he, the reason why he was these things and why uh, he, we're able to have this verse is because it was because of God. And that's really what makes it uh, when we think about the spiritual life. It's because of what God can do through us. And you can see that right there in this verse. So there's kind of a, like a parallel going on here. Uh, you see that Job started off righteous and holy because of who God is. And then he finds himself in intense testing. But that's also because of who God is. Right. That's why he's finding himself where he is. And then, as we'll see, he recovers because of who God is. And then he's blessed because of who God is. So it's kind of like this repeating scenario that God is the one who not only uh, presents things, but he also saves us from the situations. And he is also the cause of ac the actual coming to the point of repenting. He's the one who draws us to that point. Yes, it does take an actual decision on your part, but God is responsible for bringing you to the point he gets the credit for who we are as being any kind of righteous person or even faithful or even moving in the right direction. He's always the motivation or encouragement in our spiritual life. So you can remember that Job went from righteousness and then he flipped that and he kind of went into unrighteousness or a self-righteousness, we could say. And then he's, he's going to go back to righteous. And we'll see what got him back to the right side of the tracks. But whenever we see righteousness and justice, we should immediately think of the word holiness. Holiness consists of righteousness and justice. That's just part of the integrity bubble. When you think of God's essence, mostly you think of the two main ones, righteousness and justice. How does he deal with us? Well, righteousness and justice. All the other ones are in t in involved in that process. But when you think of holiness, uh, we think of God's perfection. And the Greek word, most of you already know this, but it means to set apart, to sanctify, holy, to be holy, right? And as you and I conform to the plan of God, which we do uh, every day, it sets you apart in various stages of your life. And this is that kind of that setting apart. You first have that set apart at, at salvation positionally. You're born again. God set you apart. You're now a newborn believer. Second is experientially. That's a process that happens throughout your life. You're consistently set apart. Remember, we're, we aren't just instantly holy, even though we would, that would be nice. We aren't just instantly a righteous believer even though we have God's righteousness imputed to us. We have a sin nature. And in order for those to meet together, we have to have that experience of the Christian life that's a progressive, uh, maturing process, I guess you could say, right? And that has many bumps on the head along the way. That has many tests, failed tests, many past tests. And so that's all that process that goes in that experiential sanctification throughout your lives. That's your confession of sin. That's your intake of the word of God. That's setting you apart from the rest of the crowd. Because in essence, what you're doing in God's essence is you are living a righteous life through him. And then ultimately at death, we're set apart um, from 
sin itself. And an easy way to think of these is uh, how I always remember these is first we're uh, freed from the penalty of sin and salvation. Experientially, we are freed from the power of sin. And then ultimately, we're freed from the presence of sin. Remember the three Ps. So the, the uh, penalty of sin through the cross, the power of sin through your living life and through you had the Holy Spirit, which you can defeat sin on a daily basis. And then the very presence of sin is defeated at death. So Romans 619, we can get a little bit of insight on this. It says, I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. This is Paul speaking. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. So see, the result of this is the sanctification process, that holiness. That sanctification word can also be translated holy. So it could say resulting in holiness. It means the same thing. So... Remember that holiness is that righteousness and justice together. And then we also have Paul mentioning holiness in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, this is interesting because this is referring to our experiential sanctification process. This is that setting yourselves apart in your daily walk as a Christian. Now, I feel this is really the most important part. Actually, you can't say that because you have to be saved, right? But this takes up the majority of the time. Salvation is the most important, no doubt. But look at, look at the time we spend in number two of your life. And what this is telling us is that, that we have to cleanse ourselves from defilement of flesh and spirit. And that's a perfecting aspect in our holiness. So that just means what you already know and are well aware of. Staying on top of that confessional aspect between you and God of sin. In your life so nothing new there but you can't just do that and be consistent with it uh, if you don't have something else that goes with that what you're doing right now the intake of the Word of God one thing about us is we're human and we're not very consistent unless we are doing something on a, on a consistent basis that takes our body being there if it requires just mental and you're not going through the motions consistently, most likely it's going to fade away. And that includes this spiritual life as well. We can't just take our, ourselves out of the, the church or out of spiritual growth or the word and say, you know what, I can do all this on my own. You can't do it. You've got to have that flow of consistent spiritual truth in your soul or remember it, it's going to be replaced. It's either truth or false. And this world is going to pump you full as much to the top as they can with false. You might start off with, you know, tip top to the truth, the word of God, but it, it'll take take hold of you. So. But this verse is just showing us that the way we perfect holiness, which is just by clean, that cleansing effect of the Holy Spirit. And. No surprise there. First John 1 9. We already uh, know this, but the, I thought it was interesting that the word cleanse here is the exact same word used in first John 1 9. Um, it's catharizo. Just means cleanse from sin here in both contexts. And then the result of that is we can see that back in Job. It says, therefore, men fear him. That's the result of your sanctification process, the fe a healthy fear of the Lord. That's a good thing. That's not a sinful thing. That's, you know, we can live our life in fear, in general fear, and that's a sin. Or we can live it in fear of God, and that's a healthy thing. 
because it keeps you in tune and it keeps you making right decisions. If someone knows they're gonna get the death penalty when they shoot somebody, they're kinda a little bit more hesitant to do that. That's a healthy fear. And that kind of applies to our spiritual life. When you're in tune and you know how God operates, you know how what he does, and you know how his justice and his righteousness affect you and how you're treated, that's healthy. There's nothing wrong with being in tune and knowing who God is to be able to adjust to his plan for your life. Nothing at all. Actually, very. that's a good thing. But that's that fear. That's a respect. That's an honor. That's a reverence. This is the type of fear this is referring to. It's just a, an awe aspect. I don't want to do anything wrong. That's the mindset that we have going into it. When you lose that respect, lose that fear, that's when you get off, off the path. That's what we don't want. So, and notice the next, what it says next. He does not regard any who are wise of heart. So, so these are actually complete opposites. It's kind of interesting that they're bring, brought up in the same verse. Fearing God and the wise of heart are completely opposites here. And that's why they're brought up, because it, it shows us that when we are wise in our hearts or in our own eyes is another way to say that, then you don't fear. You don't fear God. We don't fear God when we get in this mindset of some type of prideful behavior or <laughs> arrogance or any, any of those things, self-righteousness. We lose this aspect right here of the fear that this verse is talking about. And it goes both ways. If you have the fear, you can push out that pride, that arrogance. So it's either one or the other, but it needs to be known that you can't have both uh, in, this, in this context here. So God is displeased with the wise of heart. It says he does not regard the wise of heart. Um, the word regard here means to observe, to watch, or to look out for, even to give attention to. What's funny is we've been seeing Job, and what has God been doing? Nothing. He's been silent the whole time. And it makes sense when you think about what this word means. He does not look out for or give attention to. Wow. So the last thing that I want, and I know you don't want, is for God to not look out for you or watch us in the way that he desires to watch you. That's that relational aspect. That's not saying he doesn't know what you're doing. He always knows what you're doing. But you want to have that protection that includes the justice and the righteousness. Remember, that always has to be right. It always has to be fair. And when we're in this state, that's not right to God. So he must, in other words, take action. And in this case, the action we see in Job is allowing Job to take matters in his own hands, God taking a step back, and just letting him work on himself. That, that, that's the action God took. So he's very aware. But God wasn't, uh, you could say, um, he was being treated differently. We could put it like that. That's the lightest way I could put it. So uh, the issue here is, is obviously what? Sin. Always sin. Remember, I've said that a few times. Sin is always what caused the problems in our life. And God feels very strongly, as we know from Scripture, about pride or self-righteousness. Look at Proverbs 29, 23. It says, a man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. And, you know, we've got a lot of verses like this. You've seen them. Uh, they're, they're throughout Scripture and for good reason. This is what caused the, the, the fall of Satan. It's what caused the fall of Adam and Eve. It's what causes us to completely lose grip in our spiritual life. It is a potent sin. It's a nasty sin. 
And we've all got it, but it has capabilities that are huge. It can really get us uh, off track in ways that we don't want. Uh, so, and, and what we're seeing in Job is that people can have a tendency to drift towards a wise heart in the midst of suffering. Remember, we kind of talked a little bit about that. You get in that, this is, okay, this is long enough, God, type of mentality. That's that leaning towards that where Job is. And that's that, you're, the drifting aspect. And that's what also God will not tolerate, as we see in Job. It says in this verse that our pride will bring us low, and that literally means to a lower position. Literally. So God has a lot to work with when we're thinking about that. That could be financially, socially, in some position, rank, or how about your physical well-being? You can definitely be lowered to a physical, uh, lower healthy position than you were before, right? I'm not saying this is always a bad thing, but it goes to show if we're in this mind state that our mindset that this verse is referring to, this is one of the options God has. So, and you know, it's for good reason. It's for good reason of why God has all these things to bring us back. We've got to feel a little bit of fire if we're going to come back from this sin that's so over the top, it really is when you think about the results of it and how we think in that state, um, it's just you have to almost snap someone out of it. And that's why God must take us and lower us in some way to make us see that, OK, I'm not the highest. I've got to be lowered. And that it's really logical when you think about it like that, but because what the sin does is, of course, we're out of fellowship, and then we become wise in our own eyes, and then once you do that, you've essentially set yourselves against God in your mind. You've set yourself against God, and He has every right to set Himself against us. He does. He has that right. James 4, 6 says that. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See that word opposed? It's always a good idea to remind ourselves of this word. It means to range in battle against, to set oneself against. That's what this means. The last person you want to go to battle with is God. So the solution to rooting out pride in our lives of any believer was actually mentioned back in Job 33, 16. I don't know if I have that or not. No, it says, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction that he may turn man aside from his conduct and keep man from pride. Do you see that? So what are, what, is, what are we seeing there? God's instruction keeps us from pride. But it only works if you're receiving the instruction. That should be a given. God's instruction keeps you from that, that type of sin. And when we think about this, why God has to oppose this, of course it is serious. But look at the, the opposite. We've, we've got the humble and we've got the proud. So one thing about this sin is that it, there's a control aspect here. There's a control. It's about who is controlling your soul. Now, we know that when we're out of fellowship, it's not the Holy Spirit. We know that when we've sinned, we've kind of moved aside that influencing ministry or the guiding power of the Holy Spirit because remember that's something that you receive and you accept and you have to be positive to. If you're negative, God is not going to give you divine guidance according to His plan because you don't want it. That's a big part of it. Oh, well, God will still guide me. 
you've got to be fully vested and on board. That's part of fellowship. It means participation. You've got to be full participation in the plan of God when it comes to guidance. And what this sin does is it, it says who, it, well, first of all, who's controlling your soul when you're out of fellowship? It's you and your sin nature. There's nothing outside of that realm that is going to take control and show you the right path except for that. So, and we've watched that in Job. We've watched him kind of take control, take matters into his own hands, and God has politely given him control. And God will politely give you control too. He will allow you to take control in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. We can do this. And we can see with the, the results of it. He was silent. He was kind. He was a gentleman. And the whole time Job is trying to figure out all, all this mess and he's trying to plead his case to God to justify himself. Completely different mindset. So one of the problems of arrogance when we are in this state is that we're out of that harmony in relationship with God, out of fellowship. Of course, this is a sin. And there's a lot of analogies to this. One of those is we are no longer walking by means of the spirit. And that's an issue. That is an issue, a big issue for us. So the problem with that arrogance is that it rejects the solution that God requires of us. When we're in that state, we reject the one solution. But we'll go to other solutions because, remember, this is an internalized process and it's sin nature and ourselves now. So we're rolling off of something that is looking for wrong solutions at that point. And there's really only one solution that God is looking for. And we, we can see that at, later on in Job, but it's to repent. It's to repent. Acknowledge. What's going on? Remember, that's a state. You've all learned about states. It's something that you're in or you're out. When we're in a sinful state, we're in a sinful state. This isn't just a sin and then I'm going to move on. This is a sin until I confess and the state has changed. Now, that's all that God is looking for. He is looking just, and think about how simple that is. It's just an acknowledgement. We could be off the deep end on down our wrong path because we've taken control and he's just looking for that one solution. But that's the problem with pride and arrogance is it doesn't want to acknowledge. It doesn't want to do it. It doesn't want to take the credit for what the wrong that we did. Go into my house when... Those two are fighting. That one, that one, that one, that one, that one. We all do that, right? Point the finger, but you get the point. It's the same concept when it comes to ourselves. We don't want to accept and take responsibility for the wrong. So we'll justify it in any other way that we can. So arrogance doesn't want to confess or acknowledge <coughs> Because the you see the in the even in this verse, because confession requires humility. And when the sin nature is in control, humility is not to be found. There are just two opposites. And that's the reason one of the reasons why God dislikes arrogance so much is because the spiritual life requires obedience. Remember, I mentioned that this is a control issue. Well, you've got a controlling aspect and then you've got obedience somewhere in there. And then you have us in a prideful or arrogant state. That's where things get sticky. So which is only can be done whenever I think of the word obedience and authority. I have to think about humility. We have to, too, as believers. Immediately, we must think of humility because that's the only way I, you, 
can function to serve God correctly. And, and that is pleasing that he requires of us is in humility because humility is capable of, of doing because it recognizes and properly responds to God's authority. See, the opposite happens when we're in that prideful state. We reject authority, right? But God is authority. We have to be in a state of humility in order to live the spiritual life. It has to be there. There's no functioning in it otherwise. So, and really what happens is when we're here, when we're out of fellowship and we're in this prideful state, is that we really reject all authority except my own or your own. That's the one you acknowledge. That's the one you, you know, give into or uh, take advice from or look to for any kind of advice is yourself. That's a dangerous place to be. We don't want to be there. And as you all know that um, the danger in this is that when we allow God to be in control, that control includes your thoughts and your actions. But when we're out of that, we're controlling. What are we? We're not really in control, but I'm telling you that you're in control in, in this little uh, relative bubble. God's in control. But we're either in the plan or out of the plan. And we're out of the plan when we're in this state. So that's why it takes a constant adjustment. There's always adjustments that we have to make to God's authority, but it requires this right here, humility. Humility solves problems, arrogance creates them. And, and you, many of us can look back on our lives when we've made wrong decisions and you can look back and you, we can see a lot of different decisions, different sins. But really, this is usually the underlying cause of how we got so far off track. It's that pride, self-righteousness aspect. We may push that aside and say, no, that wasn't it. Oh, you know, it was because of this. Well, look a little bit lower. Go undercover the layers a little bit more. And usually this is the one, this is the culprit that's the problem of why you just happen to make those wrong decisions to begin with, you, take, you took control. You took control. Remember, if the Holy Spirit is in control, you're not. There's no between. But if you're in control, the Holy Spirit cannot be control. Cannot be in control. So that's why we can be taken off so far down that path because it's, it's that dangerous of a sin and also because it requires humility. And sometimes we see people get to that point. Sometimes we see people that don't get to that point and they will be judged and judged and judged and judged and judged. And God's like, man, I, I don't know what else to do, right? Not really. He knows what to do. Um, but it amazes me that people will look in every single other place, even an unbeliever, except the place. Can't figure it out. I had bad luck, never had hard times all my life, and I've been getting run to the ground. I got cancer. I'm everything. I'm, I've been. If you're having that rough of a life, uh, Look for solutions in a different place that works. Right? I mean, there's the, the, God provides these things for a reason because it works. And when, but the problem is we take control. We take control. And they're looking for the solutions, but they're not looking in the right place because they're giving themselves their own advice. And cancer was probably a bad example. Um, but you get the point. There's a lot of things God can do to our health when people reject him um, that is not very fun, uh, especially if you've ever 
work for hospice and you've seen these things and people can't see uh, where this is coming from, what direction it's coming from or why it's coming. They just know it, they just caught the wrong, the bad luck. That's not the way it is. That's themselves taking control and telling themselves that. So we've got to constantly adjust. And humility desires also, the good thing about humility is it desires to serve and to be obedient and therefore is the motivation to keep you going. That's how great humility is. That's what the word of God does for us. It gives you your motivation to serve. That's what we do. As Christians, we serve. We are servants to God. We are his servants. Even though his scripture tells us that he is serving us, and he is, we serve him. He is the ultimate authority to us. So, and also another aspect that's good about humility is it doesn't take issue with admitting a fault and allowing the authority of God to rule in your hearts. See, it doesn't take issue with that. We can't take issue with the acknowledgement of that because that's the one thing that keeps us moving forward in the right direction. That acknowledgement, that, that's that humility aspect, remember? But pride and arrogance do have a problem with that. And this is why God knows and treats it and why it's so dangerous of a sin because uh, well, just what we've been talking about and he dislikes it very much. It's destructive and it keeps you from breaking out of whatever haze or funk that you might find yourself in. This right here can do that. You won't recognize it. You can't figure out why you've been in this funky state. Well, go back to this and check this. Undercover those layers and see maybe this is the problem. So Elihu has pretty much been preparing Job, kind of the way I look at it, for the Lord to speak to him. He's kind of prepping him in a way. And he starts, which he does start to speak in verse 30, well, 38 is kind of where this, he doesn't immediately start, but let me read verse one. It says, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Now he's speaking. He said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I would not want to hear that from God. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Well, all I can think about is humility. We need some humility at that point. I'd be straight backpedaling if, if we were in any kind of out of fellowship. We don't want to be at this point. Oh, jump back into fellowship immediately. Okay, first of all, this is obviously something that you wouldn't want to hear or be too thrilled about hearing. And I'm sure Job isn't either. The word obscure here means to hide or conceal. And God is telling Job is he's concealing or kind of hiding his plans with words without knowledge. That's what Job has been doing. That's Job's witness. He's concealing who God is. God doesn't like that. And he even says, who's this? obscures my plans with words without knowledge. In other words, they're lies. That's basically what it boils down to. If we're saying something that's not true, it's a lie. Don't really think about that because, oh, Job was hurting, he was in pain, he was suffering, and he's kind of justified. No, if you're telling a lie, is a lie. So not only did the pride thing just, it didn't stay by itself, there's always other sins that come after the pride, always, that follow. Bubble to the top, bubble to the surface, uh, that, that come right around the corner waiting in that scenario. So concealing God's plans is just the opposite of what the Christian is supposed to be doing, by the way. 
We're supposed to be doing just the opposite, revealing, witnessing. Remember, that's your, that's your witness. You're revealing who God is through your person. Part of that means you're setting the example to others. Think about the example Job was setting. He was hiding, obscuring God's plan, painting the wrong picture on him to four people, at least that we know that were listening, that were involved. Imagine if you were one of those friends or even Elihu that probably knew Job very well and you're expecting him to be a good witness, an example Christian in the Christian life. And then he's saying things that you're wondering, how can he say that? I just saw him, you know, a faithful believer saying just the opposite wanting to worship, wanting to serve, and realizing how great God was. Now he's saying something different. That's the thing we need to be careful about in, in our lives as Christians. That could, there's a consistent aspect that not only do we set the example, but we paint a picture of who God is. And you're either drawing people towards God or you're pushing them away. We mentioned that a long time ago in a lesson. But there's two, only two things we can do in our witness. People are drawn to God through you, through you as a witness because you're setting the example. You're being guided by God himself in the power of the Holy Spirit. Or you can push them, push them away. And when we're inconsistent, look at the effects that we have on other people. We paint the wrong picture of God to other people. We do not want to do, be in that position. We don't want to do that. So um, that's just the opposite. See, the, the, what our life and, and part of the, our witness includes, always should include accuracy. Our desire is to be accurate. Think about it. If you had somebody coming up to you to scoop you up under your wing, to show you what being a good Christian was like, and they're a super uh, legalist, that's going to conceal grace. That is going to completely knock out the grace of God and confuse you about who God is because they're trying to show you it's about your good works, not about what God did for you. There's a lot of people that are concealing who God is that way. That's just a small example. But I just want to give you the idea because we can conceal too. Even when, you know, because you're around a lot of people. You're around a lot of people. We're around a lot of young people. We're around a lot of uh, uh, friends that we communicate with, that we talk to, that we associate with, phone, text, in person, work at the workplace. There's a lot of family members. There's a lot of people that we have to set an example for. And it all must relate back to God. It has to. If that's your number one priority, it will. This is not something you have to stress out about and say, how am I going to do this? How am I going to set the example? No. It's about keeping doing what you're doing, being consistent, staying in tune on top of that acknowledging sin and always keeping him top priority. Now, when you do that, your example will be set because he will be setting the example for you. We don't have to do it in our own power. We don't have to worry about what to say, what to do. That, that isn't even the issue. God takes care of the details always. It blows my mind, really, on how he takes care of the details. But the, the essence is still the same, that we have to be faithful. You have to you have to want to pro project a God to other people that is accurate. We don't want to misrepresent or misproject or uh, do the wrong thing. And that can include even the smaller things. You know, if, if you're around other Christians, that's one thing. But think about when you're around uh, other maybe unbelievers or believers that haven't grown to the level you are and they hear the things that you're saying, people take things a lot differently than you think that, than you do. And what's not a big deal to you may be a big deal to them. 
I can't tell you how big of a deal some things are to baby believers that have grown up in a religious background, and a lot of us have, a lot of you have, and certain things are big deals, but they really aren't big deals. But in your mind, they are, and you're the one that's in these people's lives to set the example. Now, if you do that, you're being a stumbling block in their life. You're not setting the example at that point. Because what are you doing? Either they're drawing them closer to God or you're pushing them back. Well, if you take part in whatever thing that it may be even legal to do, maybe even right to do, but they have a problem with it. You're being a witness. Don't do it, not for your sake, but for his sake. We're serving. That's part of the service. Is Humility requires to... Do certain, not do certain things that you may want to do and do certain things that you may not fleshly want to do either. It goes both ways. We just go. We go. And we just want to be guided. And that takes humility. So that's a good place to stop. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message. Thank you for your word. It's always... Pertinent, it's always so uh, timely, and we just uh, we appreciate everything that you do for us, and we most of all thank you for Jesus Christ because we know um, the cross is where we all started, and the cross is what you provided for us, and what that means is that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for the sins of humanity, and the reason you had to do that is because you had to pay the penalty. For our sin, you didn't have to. You graciously did that because you wanted a relationship with us even though we were separated from you by sin. You wanted to bring that back together. We couldn't do that. We couldn't reconcile that relationship, but you could and you did. And you did that through Jesus Christ. And your word tells us you, you not only did it, but you, then you turned around and it wrapped it up and gave it to us as a gift. It's a gift of God, and you offered it by faith, and you said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, and it's that simple. So that's the most important thing that we could ever ask anyone to do, so they can enjoy the wonders of your spiritual life, everything that you do. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.